Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is Bertrand Competition. In past lectures, we've encountered Cournot and Stackelberg games. These were similar in the sense that firms competed on quantities of goods produced. In contrast, we're going to have a change of pace today. Under Bertrand Competition, firms choose prices. Let's see what that looks like. In the model that we're studying, we're going to have a single decision from each of the firms. Specifically, each firm is going to choose a price. Because we're focused on duopolies in this course, we're going to have two firms, firms one and two. So all that's happening is that each firm is choosing a price, P1 and P2. And that price can't be negative. You'll notice that this is similar to Cournot in the sense that we have a simultaneous choice being made. But it's distinct from Cournot because they're choosing a price not a quantity. We have a single consumer in this model, and all the consumer does is choose whether to buy from a firm and which firm to buy from. We'll have some straightforward assumptions about this consumer. The consumer prefers lower prices to higher prices. That's basic. The consumer has a reservation price V, which we're going to assume is larger than the marginal cost of production C. Why is that? This one is not as straightforward, but in fact, it is a basic assumption so that we have a deal actually getting done. If it were the case that the reservation price of this consumer was less than the marginal cost of production, then the price at which the consumer is willing to buy is so low that no firm wants to produce at that price. That would be very uninteresting. So to get firm one and firm two to want to do business with this consumer, it makes sense to have that reservation price be set larger than C. Indeed, because this is such a basic assumption, we're not even going to see V appear in the rest of this lecture, although it will show up once again when we get deeper into Bertrand competition. The last assumption about this consumer is that the consumer is indifferent between the firms, so that if the firms were to set the exact same price, the consumer could buy from one firm, it could buy from the other firm, it could randomize between the firms, it just doesn't care. The good is a perfect substitute. We're going to have the firms with symmetric marginal cost of production, which is some value C, at least zero. Why is it the case that we're looking at a symmetric marginal cost of production? Turns out that Bertrand competition is a little bit more complicated when we have asymmetric marginal cost of production. So to keep things simple, when we're starting off here, we're going to look at the symmetric case. And then in later lectures, we'll encounter what happens when we have asymmetric marginal costs. As always, the firms just want to maximize their profit. Okay, that is the setup for the model. If you want to think on your own about what's going to happen in the equilibrium of this game, now would be the time to pause. Otherwise, I'm going to reveal the answer right now. The only equilibrium prices in this model are P1 equal to P2 equal to C. So the firms choose the exact same price, and that price is equal to their symmetric marginal cost. Think about what's happening here. If the firms are choosing the exact same price, and that price is equal to the marginal cost, there is no profit to be had. Either your firm is making the sale, but that price is exactly offset by the cost of production, in which case you're getting nothing, or your firm is not making the sale, in which case you're still getting nothing. There's no profit here. To understand why that's an equilibrium might help to draw a figure. So on the horizontal axis, I have firm one's price, so that's P1. And on the vertical axis, I have firm one's profit. And you'll notice that I've put a special marker there for the marginal cost of production on that horizontal axis. Okay, so let's think about what's happening here and whether firm one could profitably deviate away from choosing C as its cost rather as its price if firm two is also choosing P2 equal to C. Well, imagine firm one deviates to a price less than C. If that's the case, firm one is now winning in the sense that it is making the sale, but it is making the sale at a value that it does not want to make the sale at. It is charging a price that is less than what it costs to make the good. So it is getting a negative utility. So it does not want to deviate to a lower price. It also doesn't have any incentive to deviate to a higher price. 
if it deviates to a higher price, well, now it has a price that is larger than its competitor. And as a consequence of that, it is not making the sale. And if it's not making the sale, it's not getting any profit. It's not getting any profit, then that's getting the exact same outcome as it would be if it were choosing its strategy that it is supposed to in equilibrium. If it is choosing to set its price equal to the marginal cost. And so there's no profitable deviation here. So oddly enough, despite the fact that we have all of this nice space in that upper right quadrant of the figure, we're not seeing any firm having the ability to access any of those profits as long as the other firm is setting its price equal to its marginal cost. And that's why this is an equilibrium. Another question, of course, is why is this the only equilibrium? Why can't we have an equilibrium that's going to be anything other than this? Well, one of these cases is straightforward. It should be pretty obvious why we can't have an equilibrium price that is less than C. If that were the case, then whoever is the lowest price firm and is making a sale here, that firm can profitably deviate to any higher price. If it is still making the sale, well, at least it's bringing in more money, so that's good. And if it's not making the sale, well, now it's making nothing, and that's better than selling at a price that is less than how much it costs to produce. So obviously we can't have an equilibrium price that is less than C. What's less straightforward is why we can't have an equilibrium price that is greater than C. To think about why that's the case, well, let's look at two subcases. First, what happens when we have one price that is less than the other price? And without loss of generality, we'll have firm one's price being less than firm two's price. Well, if that's the case, we have firm two making nothing because its price is larger, it is not making the sale. So its payoff here is zero. But because firm one is choosing a price that is larger than C, firm two has an opportunity to actually make some profit here. It could choose any value between C and P1, which not only guarantees a sale, but it guarantees that the sale will be profitable. To visualize this, let's just draw a quick number line here. So all the way on the left, we have the marginal cost of production which is less than firm one's price, P1, and less than firm two's price, P2, at least as it is supposed to be the case in this hypothetical equilibrium. But of course, this can't be an equilibrium. If firm two was expecting this to be the case, firm two could shift its price to something between C and P1, and because now it has the lowest price, it would make the sale, and because its price is larger than C, it's profiting. So we can't have equilibrium prices being greater than C with the firms choosing different prices. The last subcase to look at is what happens when we have that equilibrium price greater than C and the firms choosing the exact same price. So let's look at firm one under this circumstance. Firm one's profit is equal to A times P1 minus C, where A is the probability the consumer buys from firm one. So when the prices are equal, that consumer is indifferent. And so A is just representing some probability between a zero and one. And whatever portion of the time we have the consumer choosing firm one, then the firm is getting its price minus its cost. So that's P1 minus C. So let's stick with firm one here and just imagine the situation where firm one is not certainly making the sale with probability one. If we are in a situation where firm one is making that sale with probability one, then all we have to do is look at firm two's incentives. It's going to be exactly the same as what we're uncovering when we're just focusing on this case with firm one and firm one not 100% of the time getting that sale. Okay, well, consider a deviation to some price PD, that subscript representing deviation, which is some amount between C and P1. This is better for firm one if PD minus C, that's what its payoff is for choosing it. Why is that? Well, it's having the lower price now because PD is a smaller amount. And that means it's always getting the sale and it's always getting a price of PD and it's paying C, so that's its utility, PD minus C. And that is better for the firm than getting the value of P1 minus C times A as long as, if you rearrange that expression, PD is larger than A times P1 plus one minus A times C. You'll notice the right hand of that inequality is a convex combination 
of P1 and C. And because we have freedom of PD to put it anywhere in between P1 and C, it's always possible to find a value that makes that statement true so that we have a profitable deviation. It might be easier to visualize what's going on here once again. So on this number line, we have C, that marginal cost of production, still being less than the prices. And of course, now we have the prices being identical between the firms. So P1 and P2 are exactly the same. Firm 1 and Firm 2 are setting the exact same price. Think about what happens if you are the firm that is not getting the sale to happen all that often, maybe 50% of the time or maybe a little bit less. Suppose you make your price just a fraction of a cent smaller. Well, now you are guaranteeing the sale. And so you are sacrificing a fraction of a cent to get more than a 50% chance increase in your probability of making the sale because now you're guaranteeing the sale for yourself. And because a tiny fraction of a penny, when you make it a fraction as small as you want it to be, you can always find a very small amount that is going to make it so that you are happier to cut the price by that small amount and guarantee the sale and then continue with this identical sort of pricing. Okay, so as I mentioned, the profits here, well, in equilibrium, there aren't any. So a natural question to ask is how firms can fix this problem. Clearly not a problem for the consumer, but if you're one of the firms here, you're getting nothing, and that's sad. And you would like to think about maybe ways that you might want to resolve that problem, or think about alternative assumptions in this general Bertrand setup that might result in you receiving a profit, which is not the case here. So that's what we're going to be investigating in upcoming lectures. Hope you enjoyed this, and hope to see you next time. Take care.